Good morning. Our call to worship today comes from Hebrews chapter 4, uh, verses 14 uh, to 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And as the people of God, we would respond to the, the Lord's call uh, for us to come and to worship him, to praise him. Uh, from Psalm 9, verses 1 and 2. I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all your marvellous works. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. And the Lord would reassure us of his promises and his blessing uh, from 1 Corinthians 1, verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us join together in his praise as we sing uh, from Psalm 66b. Psalm 66b, it's on page 138 uh, of the Psalter. Uh, we'll sing stanzas one and then three to four. Stanza one and three to four. Uh, the tune is Crediton number 70. So tune 70. Psalm 66b on page 138 and stanzas 1, 3 and 4. Um, this psalm calls on all the world to come and to give praise uh, to God, uh, to think about God's uh, power uh, at the, uh, in stanza 4. Come and the works that God hath wrought with admiration see and working to the sons of men. Most terrible is he. Um, he speaks about God. Uh, saving his people, uh, working on behalf of his people. Let, let us therefore come and sing him our praise. ourselves once again um, of the Lord's commandments uh, from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 5 and beginning at verse 6 down to verse 21. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 5 and beginning at verse 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. 
Observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son or daughter, nor your manservant or maidservant, nor your ox, your donkey, or any of your animals, nor the alien or the stranger within your gates, so that your manservant and maidservant may rest as you do. Remember that you were slaves in Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. Honour your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live long and that it may go well with you in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbour. You shall not covet your neighbour's wife. You shall not set your desire on your neighbour's house or land, his manservant or maidservant, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbour. And then we're thinking about the uh, instructions from the Heidelberg Catechism uh, on the commandments. And today we come to the eighth commandment, uh, Deuteron Deuteronomy 5, verse uh, 19, uh, you shall not steal. The Heidelberg Catechism question number 110, what does God forbid? What does God forbid in the Eighth Commandment? He forbids not only outright theft and robbery, punishable by law, but in God's sight, theft also includes cheating, and swindling your neighbour by schemes made to appear legitimate, such as inaccurate measurements of weight, size or volume, fraudulent merchandising, counterfeit money, uh, excessive interest or any other means forbidden by God. In addition, he forbids all greed and pointless squandering of his gifts. Then question 111, what does God require of you in this commandment? That I do whatever I can for my neighbor's good, that I treat him as I would like others to treat me, and that I work faithfully so that I may share with those in need. Let us join together in prayer. Our God, we praise you because you are a God who does not change. You are always the same. No matter what happens to us or around us, we can depend on you, our firm foundation, uh, to always, you always remain the same. Your character, your essence, your nature is always consistent and unchanging. And so you're altogether reliable and trustworthy. Heavenly Father, you are our firm foundation. And we praise the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the chief cornerstone and our rock of safety. He was rejected and despised by men, but you chose him to be your living temple. Heavenly Father, we pray today that by the help of your Holy Spirit, you would help us to rely upon him as our rock, as our solid foundation, and not to, to build our lives or to put our trust on sand, which the storm of judgment will sweep away with a great and mighty fall. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gracious and wonderful gift of your Holy Spirit to everyone who puts their trust in Christ. We thank you for the help of your Holy Spirit in bringing us to faith and salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And Father, we pray today for the help of your Holy Spirit that we might be instructed by your word, that you would strengthen us through your word, that you would build us up as your people, that you would bring comfort uh, and consolation to those who are in difficulty, who are in need. We pray that your word would be light to those who are confused, who are stumbling. We pray, our Heavenly Father, also that your Holy Spirit would work in the hearts and lives of those who join with us, those who we pray for, who belong to us, who are dear to us, who are close to us, who as yet are not part of your glorious kingdom. Father, they're, they're reveling in, in the dross of this world when there's so much, so much riches, so much blessings to be had and only to be had in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh God, that you would open their eyes to see that their sin is, is, not, is not pleasure, it's not good, it is shameful, it is wicked, it is deplorable in your sight, and it is undoing them and bringing them to your judgment. Father, deliver them, open their eyes to see the wonders of Christ, the blessings of Christ, and Father, in your mercy, by your Spirit, draw them to believe and trust in him. We thank you that you've brought us together here today through uh, these technical means. We thank you that we can still uh, have fellowship with one another in this way uh, and have fellowship with you because your spirit is not bound. Uh, we are not tied to uh, a building. We thank you, O oh God, that we are connected. We are in union with our Lord Jesus Christ and through him with one another. And so we're not only united here in Carrick, but we're united to our brothers and sisters throughout the ends of the earth. And we pray, our Heavenly Father, that your word your word would go forth to the ends of the earth today and bring forth praise and glory and honour to your name and bring salvation to men and women and young people uh, throughout this world. Father, we, we think of those who are in particular need within the congregation at this time. Uh, we thank you, O oh God, for Ronnie and Rosemary and the, their commitment and their love for the congregation here uh, and as they have particular needs at this time we commit them into your loving hands and your keeping uh, of them we pray that they might know uh, grace sufficient for them today we pray that they might be strengthened in the spirit empowered by your spirit uh, to give you all the praise and all the glory and our Heavenly Father, we pray for those who feel cut off, who feel separated, who feel alone, who are weary, uh, who uh, are disheartened. We pray, O oh God, that your word would lift them up and that you would carry them by your word, by the strength and the power of your word, that they might be buoyed up by it and given great hope and given light, light at the end of the tunnel light in whatever their such difficult situation might be, that they too would give you uh, praise, honour and glory. Father, we have broken your law in many, many ways, even already at the beginning of this Lord's Day. And Father, we, uh, we steal, we steal in various ways, perhaps not taking something so obvious uh, that be belongs to somebody else, but we, we, we steal, we rob you, we, we, we misuse our gifts, we misuse what you have blessed us with. Father, forgive us for all the ways in which we've offended you. Accept us through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's only through him that we can draw into your gracious and holy presence and not be consumed by your anger. We thank you for all that Christ has done 
to save sinners like ourselves. Father, hear all our prayers because we come through him, our mediator, our saviour and our Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our reading uh, today is uh, again in Paul's letter to the Colossians and uh, we're just looking at a couple of verses today but we'll again set it uh, within the context so we'll read Colossians chapter 1 uh, beginning of verse 1 down to verse 23. Colossians chapter 1 uh, beginning at verse 1 and down to 23. Paul an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the holy and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace and peace to you from God our Father. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, because we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love you have for all the saints, the faith and love that spring from the hope that is stored up for you in heaven and that you've already heard about in the word of truth, the gospel that has come to you. All over the world, this gospel is bearing fruit and growing just as it has been doing among you since the day you heard it and understood God's grace in all its truth. You learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf and who also told us of your love in the spirit. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God being strengthened with all power to his, according to his glorious might, so that you may have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father, who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities. All things were created by him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church, he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you wholly in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard and has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, became, become a, a servant, have become a servant. Amen. May the Lord bless to each and every one of us the reading and hearing of his own word. Let us again uh, sing in praise to God of Psalm, uh, Psalm 92b on page 217 uh, of the Psalter, page 217. Uh, the tune is Effingham number 80. So tune uh, 80 and uh, the Psalm 92b. And we're going to sing stanzas one and two, and then over the page, uh, stanza four. One and two, and then four. Um, this is another psalm of praise uh, for God's work, uh, God's works of providence and God's work of redemption. 
Um, he is a God of mercy. He is a God, also a God of judgment, mercy and judgment. Matthew Henry, uh, commenting on uh, this particular psalm, uh, sums it up as God is the ruin of sinners and he is the joy of saints. The ruin of sinners and the joy of saints. Let the saints of God uh, join together in his praise. Please keep your Bibles open at Colossians chapter uh, 1, uh, following on uh, from the introduction uh, to his letter uh, and then his prayer for the Colossian church, his thanksgiving to God for the Colossian church, and then his extended thanksgiving for what God has, has done for not only for the Colossians, but for Paul and for all of God's people. Paul then begins his uh, teaching section uh, in verse 15 of chapter 1 and the, he begins by uh, showing the supremacy of the message of the gospel uh, and it is supreme because of the supremacy, the preeminence of Christ, the, the one whom this message, this gospel is all about. Uh, and first of all we looked in verses 15 to 17 of his uh, the Christ's relationship uh, with creation and then last time last week uh, in his uh, Christ's relationship with his church with the church in verse 18 Christ is the head of the body and today we're looking at the next uh, two verses verses 19 and 20 uh, where Paul continues to, to show Christ's preeminence and again uh, as we've said before, and we're, we're only uh, just starting in, into Colossians, it's all about him. It's all about him. It's all about Christ. In Look at verse 19. In him, verse 20, by him and through him, that is through his blood. Verses 19 and 20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. First of all, then, in verse 19, in him, in him, for it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. Jesus Christ is preeminent because he is divine he is god all of god's fullness all of god's fullness dwelt in him paul says that it, it pleased the father it pleased the father that in him 
all the fullness should dwell. This word that he uses, uh, that God was pleased, pleased, it sometimes has the sense of uh, God choosing, God electing, uh, which is, is very appropriate here in verse 19. It's used elsewhere uh, in, in the scriptures. Luke chapter 12 and verse 32 uses the word in this very way. Um, Luke says, it is, it is your father's good pleasure uh, to give you the kingdom. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It was his pleasure. It pleased the father. God chose to, to give you the kingdom. Again, Paul in 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21. It pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. It pleased God. God chose what seems foolish to some, that is preaching, to save those who believe. It pleased God. God chose to do this. Also in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 15, Paul says, It pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. It pleased God. It, God chose to call me, Paul, through his grace. So in verse 19, it has the sense that God in all his fullness, God in all his fullness has chosen to dwell in Christ. Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, Paul goes, goes on to say, For in him, in Christ, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Just as, as God's glory uh, had dwelt uh, in the tabernacle, and then later on, God's glory dwelt in the temple. Uh, in other words, Jesus is is fully divine. He's fully divine. He is God because God dwells in him completely. Do you remember uh, uh, John chapter 1 and verse 14 where John says that the word Christ became flesh and he dwelt among us. The word, the word dwelt there means he tabernacled uh, among us. Christ came into this world as the, the temple of God. He replaces the temple as the place where not God now dwells. The tabernacle, temple, and then God himself comes in the person, Jesus Christ, to dwell uh, among us. The situation in Colossae is that some teachers have come in, some men have come in, and they're, uh, they're, they're coming in with their ideas of philosophy and uh, pagan philosophy, and they're trying to influence the Colossian church. Now, the Colossians, they had been brought up in this atmosphere uh, with, with many of these things, and, and they were familiar uh, with them. But these men are trying to influence the uh, Colossian church and to bring them back to uh, old ways, uh, old ideas. Uh, but uh, they're trying to lead them up, off in a, in a different direction. And these philosophies that they would have brought um, there was a lot of talk about fullness, and you see that coming up again and again in Paul's letter to the Colossians. They, they talked a lot about uh, fullness. They were emphasizing that uh, our spiritual relationship with God uh, comes through this experience of fullness. And that fullness comes about by, by gaining uh, special knowledge, uh, by, by doing certain things, by practicing certain rituals. Uh, Paul talks about in, in Colossians 2, verse 21, uh, some of the, do, don't touch this, don't touch that, do not taste, do not handle, uh, and so on. So they were coming with all these ideas uh, that people had to, to do or to believe in order to experience this spiritual fullness or spiritual fulfillment. And Paul is reminding here, uh, reminding the Colossians, the fullness of, the fullness, all that you need to be fulfilled spiritually is all to be found in Christ and in him alone. God in all his fullness dwells in Christ. The fullness 
of the Godhead in Christ. The word that uh, Paul uses here for fullness uh, indicates totality. But Paul doesn't leave it at that. Paul adds the word all, all fullness. It's exclusive, all fullness. Only in Christ can fullness be found. Nothing needs to be added to Christ. Nothing can be added uh, to Christ. Christ is God in all his fullness. We don't need to add ideas uh, we don't need to add other practices or add rituals or to seek experiences to be complete as believers, as Christians. We only need Christ in him, in him. Then secondly, in verse 20, by him, by him, and by him, By him, through him, uh, here, uh, I, I was working from a different, uh, 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 I was working from the New King James, but here we've got in uh, uh, ESV, through him to reconcile to himself uh, all things. Uh, by him to reconcile all things to himself. By him, whether things on earth or things in heaven. The sentence uh, begins, in verse 19, the sentence carries on in verse 20. And uh, in the Greek, if something is important or something is to be emphasized, then it's brought to the start of the sentence. And that's what Paul does here by him or through him here in the ESV. They're placed at the, the very start uh, of the sentence uh, for emphasis. Jesus is preeminent because his work of reconciliation takes universe. It takes in everything, things on earth and things in heaven. On a previous occasion, verses 15 to 18, we, we noted uh, Christ's lordship over creation, over all things. He is Lord over all. Verse 15, he is the, the firstborn over all creation. Verse 16, by him all things were created. And also in verse 16, all things were created through him and for him. But here in verse 20, Paul speaks of, of a need for reconciliation uh, with all things. There needs to be a reconciliation that takes place. There, there has been something that has disrupted uh, the relationship between all things and their creator. Though all things were created by him, through him and for him, all things no longer have the relationship with their creator that they were intended to have. Therefore, there needs to be uh, a reconciliation. There needs to be a restoration. The word that Paul uses here for, for recon, reconciliation, he also uses it uh, in his letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians, um, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 16, the same word as uh, also in uh, Colossians 1 and verse 21. Uh, there are variations of the, the word uh, elsewhere in Paul's letter. But the word refers to the, the restoration of fellowship between God and sinners. But here in, in verse 20, it's not talking about God and sinners. It's talking about all things, not, not a reference to sinners. It's, it's, it's a reference to the created uh, universe, all things on earth, all things in heaven. The same phrase, all things is used by Paul in, in verse 16. And when he uses it there in verse 16, he's talking about all creation. Um, so what, what does Paul mean uh, that Christ reconciles all things on earth and in heaven? Well, the, the Old Testament points us in the, in the right direction here. Again and again uh, in the Old Testament, we see the Old Testament prophets looking forward 
uh, to a, a day, the last day, when, when God would establish universal shalom, universal shalom, uh, the word that means peace, wholeness, well-being. So the prophets are looking forward to a day when everything uh, will be restored to its rightful place, when everything will be restored uh, to God, that when there will be peace, wholeness, well-being, uh, a peace that would bring security and blessing to God's people, to Israel. But th they also suggest a, a restoration for the wider creation uh, that has suffered from the effects of man's fall uh, into sin. Uh, and this is the very thing that Paul picks up uh, on in his letter to the Romans. Romans chapter 8, and verses uh, 19 to 22. And I'll just uh, read this uh, because it ties in with what Paul is thinking about here in Colossians 1. Romans 8, uh, and verses 19 to 22. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. So Paul pictures creation as, as groaning, as waiting, earnestly waiting uh, to be restored back to, to what it was before the fall. Uh, deliverance from bondage, uh, the bondage of corruption, to be released from the consequences of the fall by him, by Christ, who is going to reconcile all things. Restoration, renewal of all creation by him, all things, that is, all that is under the rule of his sovereign power. Christ's work in, or God's work in, in, in Christ is a, a reclamation uh, of the entire universe, a, a restoration of relationship with the natural world. He is able to reconcile all things because the divine fullness dwells in him. He is Lord, Jesus is Lord. The leadership of Christ is evident in this exercise of reconciliation. Paul continually refers to the Lordship of Christ that he is over all. Um, he is the risen Lord, uh, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 5. Uh, Paul says, we, we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus, our Lord. Lord, Lord over all. God raised him from the dead, seated him, seated him at his right hand. Ephesians 1 verses 20 to 23. He raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion. And every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Again and again, scriptures assert Jesus is Lord. He is Lord over all. He is enthroned above all powers. He rules as head over the church. He is the ascended Lord who has triumphed over his enemies, over Satan, over death. Jesus is Lord. And reconciliation is only going to come about by him or through him. Then thirdly, again in verse 20, uh, through him, through him, that is through his blood, by making peace, through his blood shed on the cross. He has brought about this reconciliation. He has made it possible, the restoration and the renewal of all things through the blood of his cross, through his sacrifice, through his work of redemption. The price for peace, 
the price for redemption, the price for reconciliation was his shed blood. Peace, deliverance from corruption is through him. He brings about the restoration of all things, but a far greater sig significance for you and for me and for all mankind is that he has made reconciliation possible for sinners uh, like us. For the scriptures say that we have all sinned. We have all broken God's law, not just the eighth commandment. We've broken all 10 in various ways. We're all guilty. We are all under God's condemnation because of our sin. And the penalty to pay for our sin, for our breaking of God's law, the curse of the law is, is death. That is our verdict. Uh, we are at enmity uh, with God. But he has made peace. He has made this peace possible. He has made reconciliation possible. And he's done it through the blood of his cross. To have peace with God, we need to trust in him. The only one who has paid the price for peace. The only one who makes peace possible. And he's done it with his own blood. That is, he's given his life so that we may have life, so that we might have peace with God, that we might be reconciled, that we're, we will be enemies no more, that we, we will be uh, at, at a difference with him no longer, but we will have peace with him. Without God, without him, the scriptures say that we're dead. We're spiritually dead and we're condemned to die an eternal death, which is the penalty that is due uh, to us for breaking his law. So we all need to be rescued. We all need to be transferred out of the awful kingdom that we belong to, the, the kingdom of darkness that he's already spoken about, Paul's already spoken about. We need to be rescued from this kingdom of darkness, the domain of, of Satan, and brought into a completely different kingdom, the kingdom of the son of his love, the kingdom of light. We need to be changed. We need to be made different. We need new life. We're, we're going to death. We need life. We need spiritual life. We need to be born again. We need to be born from above. We need a spiritual birth. We can't do that. We can't birth ourselves. We cannot do this work in ourselves. We need a work of God's spirit in our hearts. We need God's God to be at work to change us, to bring us out of death and into life, to bring us out of darkness and into light. We need to be saved from this body of death because that's, that's what the condemnation is already over us, is that we're, we're, we're going to die. We're going to be condemned. We need to be rescued. We need a savior. We need Jesus. We need Jesus. We need him. Only him. Only through him can we have peace with God because it is only him who's paid the price for us to have that peace and it is through the blood of his, his cross. That is through his sacrificial death on the cross, taking our sin taking our sin upon himself, taking our penalty, what's due to our sin upon himself, and paying the price in full to save us from our sin, to save us from the judgment to come, to save us from eternal death. Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. We can only truly and genuinely acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord by the work of God's Holy Spirit uh, within us. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 3, no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. 
we'll, we'll not acknowledge that, that Jesus is Lord, that he is all, that it's all about him without a work of God's Holy Spirit uh, within our hearts, within our minds. Those who've come to faith began their new life by receiving Christ Jesus as Lord. Colossians 2 verse 6, Paul is going to go on and say, as you receive Jesus, Christ Jesus the Lord, you receive Christ Jesus the Lord, you believed him, you trusted in him, so walk in him, so live for him. Only those who confess him as Lord will be saved. Romans 10 verse 9, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Christians affirm that Jesus is Lord. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, they call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. That's how they're identified. That's how they're made known. They call on Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is Lord. He is preeminent. He is over all. He's over all creation. Um, it's only through him that uh, we can uh, receive reconciliation, peace with God. The question is, he is Lord, but is he your Lord? Is he your Lord? Jesus, in him, all the fullness of God dwells in him and it does so because he is God by him reconciliation peace with God but that reconciliation only can only come about because of through him through him redemption the price being paid through his blood through his sacrificial death so is he is he your Lord? Is he your Lord? The, the scriptures lay out for us that there are only two camps. Either Jesus is your Lord and you belong to God and his people, or you belong to a different Lord and you're not one of God's people. There's only one other master that Jesus refers to, and that Lord, that master is God's enemy. That is the devil. And the devil has his followers in, in bondage to serve him. They're in bondage to their sin. They're, he leads them in rebellion against God. He's not upfront about it. Uh, you think you might be doing your own thing and finding your own way and wanted to, to plot your own course. The Bible tells us there's only two camps. You're either in one or the other. You're not sitting on any fence. There's no fence. One or the other, one place or the other. You're either Jesus is Lord, your Lord, or God's enemy is your Lord. So the question I want to leave with you all uh, this morning is is he your Lord is he your Lord praise God praise God because it's a work of God's grace of God's mercy of God's love that has brought you into that relationship it's not because of, you're any better than anyone else we're all sinners we're all in the same boat but some have got out of that boat and walked on water in faith to the Saviour, trusted in him. If you're serving a different master, the other master, have you considered where's it going to end? Where's it going to end for you? Well, you don't need to wait to find out because God's word tells you. Following that Lord, God's enemy, is going to end in destruction, eternity, separated from 
the Lord of the universe, the Lord of overall creation. May God have mercy uh, on you today and use his word to light up the path, the way, the narrow way, which leads to his son, uh, Jesus Christ. Let us close as we sing his praise uh, from Psalm, Psalm 95. Psalm 95 uh, on page uh, 224 of the Psalter, page 224. Psalm 95, um, where it sings stanzas uh, five to seven. It's on page 224, page 224, stanzas five to seven of Psalm 95. Uh, the tune is Dunfermline number uh, 76. The psalmist uh, here calls on, uh, calls on us to, to worship our creator, the one true God. And he says in stanza seven, if you hear his voice, if you hear the Lord speaking uh, to you today, the Lord over all creation, the Lord of salvation, if you hear him speaking to you through his word uh, today, hear his voice. Don't harden your hearts uh, as some have done in the past. Come to him in worship. Come to him in confession, in repentance and in faith. And he promises to be a good Lord to you. He promises to be your good shepherd uh, and to keep you with his own hand. Five to seven, let's stand. Or you can sit. And I can't see you. <laughs> let's join together in the worship of God. Psalm 95, uh, five to seven. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, this portion of your word that we have been coming back to again and again. And we thank you that it is such a, a full treasure uh, of truths uh, concerning uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and that he is preeminent, that he is uh, over all. We praise you that it's all about him. And we ask for your Holy Spirit, to fill our minds and our hearts with him, with the Lord Jesus, with what he has done for sinners like ourselves. We thank you for our salvation. We thank you for rescuing us from the shame and the, the sin uh, and the, the wickedness in which, which we once walked, just as the as you did for the Colossians and many others like them. We thank you, O God, for rescuing us and bringing us into such a, a wonderful kingdom, the kingdom of light, a, a kingdom that we knew nothing about, that, that didn't even register uh, in, our, uh, in our thinking at all, except for your intervention in the work of your spirit to awaken us to our desperate plight and our desperate need outside of Christ. We thank you, O oh God, that you confronted us and you challenged us with our sin and with our shame. And we thank you, O oh God, in your mercy that that wasn't the end of it, 
but that you showed us the, the, your plan, your rescue plan through your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to reconcile us, enemies of God, to reconcile us to yourself through the blood, the precious blood of your son shed on the cross, his sacrificial death on the cross in our place to deal with our sin, to do away with our sin and to begin a work in us to make us sons and daughters more and more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that you're doing that work in us. And we ask your forgiveness for how often we still fail and we still sin against you. We pray, O oh God, for your help today to walk in your ways, to walk in the light, to walk in the spirit, and so to honour and please you, our God, our Saviour, and the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray for one another. We pray that you would build us up, that you would strengthen us, that you would give us grace sufficient for whatever our particular needs are at this time, that we would be filled as the people of God, that the fullness of Christ would, would, would flow through us and in us uh, and with a fullness of joy in all that you've done for us through him. Father, keep us ever looking to Christ, ever looking to Christ. Give us that eternal perspective, which your, your servant Paul speaks of so often, that we might not be drowned by the, the sin and the mire of what is around us in this world, but that our eyes might be lit in wonder at what lies ahead, what lies before us, to be with Christ and to be like him. Heavenly Father, have mercy upon our loved ones. Have, have mercy upon those still in darkness. Deliver them. Deliver them, O God, through the power of your word, through this precious word even today. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. I would like to thank uh, Reverend McDonald again for his ministry with us this morning. And uh, now he follows the announcements for uh, today and uh, time ahead. So at 6 p.m. we will be meeting again using the Zoom uh, app uh, for prayer. And this evening that is being led for us by David Julie. So please pass any points of prayer to David uh, for this evening's prayer meeting. Uh, then, Lord willing, Reverend McDonald will conduct evening service for us at 7 p.m. On Wednesday evening, our uh, Bible study continues, and we will be looking at chapter 5 of the Meeting God Bible Study booklet. So please, again, contact myself if you need access to those materials. Then, Lord willing, next Sabbath, Reverend Vincent McDonald again will be with us both morning and evening service. Uh, just to remind everybody, that our own pastor, Reverend Coulter, is still available for pastoral care. Uh, please contact him should you wish to speak to him about this. And then an announcement from uh, session uh, in the coming days and weeks ahead. Uh, session, uh, namely myself and Ronnie, will be in contact with members and adherents regarding organizing virtual pastoral visitation. Uh, and the purpose of this is to discuss some of the areas uh, of congregational life that we have been discussing uh, at the start of the year. Uh, and we will make sure that um, that virtual visitation will suit uh, you in terms of the, the means that we carry that out. So just a, um, a mention that uh, in the coming days and weeks that you'll be contacted by myself or Ronnie regarding this. And then the final uh, matter just is something to remember in prayer. Uh, you will probably be aware that the church has produced a leaflet that is being uh, uh, given out uh, around um, areas in uh, Carrick Fergus. Uh, this is being distributed on our behalf by the Royal Mail and uh, it's very much focused on um, the situation in terms of COVID-19 but also then uh, what is our response to that and where is God in the midst of all of this. 
So uh, please remember that in prayer. And uh, hopefully we will see uh, a number of you, or at least 